Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This Fireside Chat, episode 60, The Big Six Zero, recorded November 17th, 2014. This is Dan and Matt back with you, and I can't believe it, but today is episode 60. How you doing, Matt? Awesome. I can't believe we've actually hit 60 episodes. They say the most podcasts that aren't going to make it stop after 10 episodes. The fact that we're at 60, that's quite impressive. It feels like we've been doing this forever. I know. Just can't shut up about Flames Hockey. Well, and, and this year it's a lot easier to talk about than last year, too. I remember sitting around last year sometimes saying... What can we talk about that's not just ragging on the team? And this year they've given us a lot of positive stuff to talk about. So, I don't know about you, but I'm having a lot more fun doing the show this year. Winning is better than losing. For sure. We don't have to kind of psych ourselves into these weird storylines. We can actually watch a team that's just winning. Yeah, well, this week at least they won both their games, so that's pretty awesome. That was. That was really good. Well, let's let's talk about that. So, since we... We talked last. Uh, we talked right after the the uh, game against the Carolina Hurricanes, where we lost four to one. And then after that, they went on a two game home tear. They beat the Coyotes five uh, three, and you and I were there. That was quite a good game. Mhm. A thought, lot more interesting than the usual Coyotes matchup, which is like watching paint dry. And I mean, the guy that we all noticed in that game was Paul Byron. I thought that Byron. I've forgotten at times that he was a member of this Flames roster this year because he really hasn't been all that spectacular. And you'd almost think that he sat in the press box for a game because he came out and had a fantastic game. But what a good showing for him. Yeah, he's been a bit snake bit this year. He He's had many breakaway opportunities. He just can't seem to beat the goalie. Like, I remember that one play in Florida where the Panthers goalie was knocked to the side of the net and he had the wide open net and he only he's managed to hit the end of his pad <laughs> before Giordano put it in. So it's good to see that the bounces are finally starting to go his way. Yeah, and I mean even like you were talking about the fact that he can't convert sometimes. I think he he didn't make it on what two empty net chances in that game. Yeah, something like that. So, you know, we're all really hoping he was going to get the hat trick. Everybody's sitting there at the dome, but he didn't. But even when he didn't have the puck, even when it wasn't him going on the net, he was a good offensive player all night. Like, it seemed like every time I looked over, there was Byron doing the right things. Yeah, and he carried that on into the Ottawa game where he scored the opening goal for the Flames. And he also had a boarding penalty, which was kind of surprising. Yeah, I noticed that in that game. And that was a game that they won 4-2. to two. Um, A game that I thought for a while might not have gone in the Flames' favor. No, after Giordano went down with that injury to his eye, I was worried that the Flames might fall apart a bit. But they managed to stick with it, and he returned, and everything settled down from then on in, and they got the two points. And even, I mean, when I was watching that game in the in the third, I mean, we were up by, it was 3-1 to one at one point, and then they got the Bobby Ryan goal, and we started getting in some penalty trouble there. And I was really worried that Ottawa was going to start coming back. And credit to the Flames for being able to kill the penalties as well as they did. But they ended up with the 4-2 win, and, and it, was, it, was a really, it was a really good game. I generally don't like watching Ottawa-Calgary games for some reason. I don't know why, but over the years I found they haven't always been great games. Ottawa doesn't play as well as they do here as they do against other teams sometimes, but that was a fun one. Yeah, and a major credit goes to the defensive play of Josh Juris on that 5-on-3 penalty kill late in the third period. Uh, he won the draw on the faceoff, and he got the puck out a couple of times during that kill, so I thought that was worthy of a shout-out. Not only Juris, but the other guy that we saw uh, coming around this week, especially in the Coyotes game, was Sven Berchi, who he seemed like uh, Byron's partner in crime there. I think he got a point on both of Byron's goals, if I remember correctly. All three. All three. three. Yeah, he was the one that set him up. So there you go. So he's finally starting to come around. And, I mean, 
you and I have said let's not count him out yet, and it seems like maybe he just needed some time to get going this season. But he's finally starting to contribute, which I'm glad to see. Yeah, and like when we watched him play in the AHL, like he was making all the right plays. They would just screw up right at the last second, and that was even notable when he was up here in the first couple of games that he played. Now, finally, though, it seems like those passes where they would just miss the mark or hop on the guy are now actually hitting the player's stick instead, so it's good. And I mean, we know this guy's a talented player. We've talked about a lot in the past. We won't harp on it again, but we know he's a talented player. He's not a bust by any means. And to me, it almost seems like he needed just to get comfortable with a set of line mates. Mm -hmm. And not be playing with a guy like Devin Setaguchi, who has struggled mightily this year in his own right. Yeah, and I think him and Byron are looking good together. I'll be curious to see who they put on that line with them going forward. Um, but it's, if those two keep going the way they are, I think that they may have something going on there that I hope will last for a while. Yeah, and realistically, guys like Colborn and Mason Raymond aren't expected back in the lineup for probably another week or so. So it gives the kids another few three games or so to make their final audition so to speak to stay in calgary for sure you know it's weird talking about that is um i've been looking at a lot of teams around the league and talking to a lot of fans of other teams and i don't think anyone else has been more excited to have so many that or i shouldn't say to have but i don't think many teams have been as excited with the progress their team has made when top players have been out. I mean, if you look at our roster and who's out, Raymond, Stajan, Colborn, Backland, core piece of this team. But as fans, I think we're really excited to see what we're getting with those guys out. Well, it also helps giving the opportunity for guys like Granlund and Juris and Berchi to come in and show that they too are NHL caliber players and they deserve a spot here. And especially the Juris and Granlund, they have contributed at such a high level that I don't see how there's any way you can send them back down. Yeah, for sure. And I'm I'm hoping it'll be next week, if not the week after. I hope that it's going to be exciting when some of these players come back and we start to see the Flames making some roster moves. And I'm hoping we're going to get to talk about that very soon. Mm-hmm. That'll definitely be something to keep an eye on. But, I mean, it wasn't like it has been in past years where it's, oh, crap, we got to call a guy up from the farm. It was sweet. We get to see some of these young players come up and show us what they've got, and that's been a really fun thing to watch this year. Definitely. It's a good departure from previous seasons, for sure. Speaking of some of that talent that we brought up from the farm, um, we, Matt found a really good article today on hockeysfuture.com. We'll link to the full article on our show notes at firesidechat.ca. But the article deals with all the teams in the NHL and who has some of the best developmental systems and prospect pools in the league. And surprisingly, um, Hockey's Future rates Calgary as number two. I don't think anyone expected that. They were sixth last year, and now they're number two this year in this ranking. And I think after what we've seen, there's no doubt that we have one of the, the deeper prospect pools in the league, which I think for Flames fans, after so many years of hearing the cupboards bare, it's such a nice change. Yeah, and with the emergence of guys like Juris, Granlund, Furland, Berchi on the NHL roster, we're seeing good performances in the AHL from guys like Ben Hanowski, Corbin Knight, Bill Arnold, and a whole bunch of other guys, Emile Poirier. And like even uh, some of our picks from last year, Hunter Smith, Mason McDonald, and Austin Carroll, they have all been doing exceptional in the, on their junior teams. Well, don't forget so, even guys like Jankowski and Klimchuk, too. Oh, I know. It seems that when it comes to forwards, the Flames have been hitting the mark with pretty much everybody. I was going to say, that list is all just forwards. Yeah, we're not even talking guys like Wather, Spoon, Kulak, Culkin... Seal off and a whole bunch of other guys. So McDonald, Gillies, Ordeo. Yeah, it's actually amazing how 
talented this team was. When I first watched a bunch of these players live back in uh, the July 2013 development camp, I remember commenting to Craig Conroy that this is the most talented group of players that I think the Flames have ever assembled, at least as long as I've been a fan, which, you know, I'm only 29, so, you know, 25 years. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you know, there's some depth, there's some holes in the system for sure, but I think it's quite amazing how quickly we were able to turn around our pool from going from seemingly having empty cupboards to having, you know, quite a full stocked um, farm roster and young players within the system at all levels. It didn't take the team very long to be able to go through and, and I guess, you know, fill those holes. So that's pretty impressive too, how quickly they were able to say, we need a rebuild, we need to get some young players in there, and now we've got them. Yeah, and major props needs to go out to Jay Feaster and uh, the, his whole group when he was the general manager for selecting a large portion of the upper end of the prospect pool for their Calgary now. Feaster gets a lot of flack for his time here in Calgary, but you're right. I mean, he laid the groundwork for a lot of what this system is right now. Mm-hmm. Well, like, guys like Berchie, Grandland, Goudreau, Watherspoon, Jankowski, Sealoff, Monahan, Poirier, Klimchuk, on and on and on, those were all his guys that he selected. So, you know, you can't be grateful for what they've doing now without giving him a, you know, thumbs up for getting these players into the system. Yeah, and and I think he probably had the foresight before anyone else that this team isn't going to last the way it is. It needs to start getting younger, and I think even before they officially used the term rebuild, he was seeing that and starting to put some players out there. And yeah, he made some questionable picks, perhaps, like Mark Jankowski, but, you know, overall, you've got to like what Jay Feaster did here as far as young players. Well, even Jankowski is performing well in Providence thus far this season. So even though it's not as flashy of a pick as it could have been, he's doing well. And anytime you can get a six foot three center that has offensive and defensive abilities, that's good. <laughs> Whether he translates or not is yet to be seen. Yeah, no, for sure. And, I, you know, I like him. I've seen him a few times online with some uh, NCAA clips that I've watched. He looks like a good player. I hope that by the time he comes in that he doesn't get lost in the mix. That's my only worry with him is he doesn't look like a spectacular offensive forward, and I worry that he might get kind of lost in the mix somewhere. Well, even if he turns into a guy like Martin Hansel where he's a good defensive center... We need that too. So it's one of those things that it having more good prospects is better than not. And you can never have too many prospects. And even if you have to end up moving some out for other assets, that's yeah. one of the things you can do with them. Well, plus development itself isn't isn't a linear process. And just because Jankowski might not be having flashy stats at the NCAA double A level. It, look at Josh Juris. He didn't have particularly great stats either, and yet he's come in and he has, I think, seven or eight points already this season. So it's not... It just depends on what they do moving forward. For sure. I think one of the other things that we have to give the Flames props for is their ability to find diamonds in the rough. If you look at a lot of their premier guys, this team is not made up of primarily first and second round picks. I mean, we've got the captain, Mark Giordano, who's an undrafted free agent. Curtis Glencross, who was undrafted. Jonas Hiller, who was undrafted. TJ Brody is a fourth round pick. Johnny Gaudreau went in the fourth round. Kerry Ramo is a sixth round pick. D- Dennis Weidman, who's an eighth round pick. David Jones is a ninth round pick. So whether they drafted these guys or they were able to acquire them later, I mean, a lot of these guys, you know, look at Glencross. He was not a... a big name player when we brought him in here you know same thing with um you know tj brody we draft him late so they have this ability to find talent 
And they've had this ability for years. I mean, they did it with Kippersoff when they brought him in and all sorts of these guys. But they're good at finding kind of the diamonds in the rough and bringing them in and letting them shine. Well, even a player like Josh Juris, like he was actually offered a tryout with both Boston and Vancouver, who turned him down, and the Flames managed to find something in his game that they liked, and, you know, we're getting the rewards from that. It's actually quite remarkable how much talent the Flames have acquired via random-ish places. You know, like, not your first overall picks like Monaghan or Poirier, but just the not traditional methods. <laughs> and I think that's going to be what what sets our rebuild apart from a lot of other rebuilds around the league. If you look at most teams they're rebuilding, they've got, you know, six, seven first and second round premier players making up the core of that. And if you look at our rebuild, a lot of the core guys are going to be those undrafted guys, those later round picks. Not to say our first round picks aren't going to factor in, but I mean, if you look at someone like Johnny Gaudreau went in the fourth round, made the team out of camp, Someone like Sven Berchi, who's a first-round pick, didn't. So I think that's cool about the Flames, that we've got this mix of a little bit of everything, and we can get good talent out of all these different players. Well, the thing is, is that a championship team needs depth. And usually, if you're starting a rebuild, you need to have about 20 good prospects in your organization. and Because some hit the wall... Some just don't develop, but if you have enough of them, you'll get enough good pieces where you can build the team around. And having guys like Juris and Byron and all the other not traditional guys coming through, that helps to flesh out that 20 or so prospects that you need in order to get the core of a championship caliber team. And the last time the Flames won the Cup, in the years prior, they were getting good results from guys like Joel Otto and a whole whack of players that were not traditional picks as well. And that's how they were able to build a team. So with the current iteration doing the same thing, hopefully in a couple of years we see similar end results. Even if you look at the team in 04 that took us to the Stanley Cup Finals, um, we didn't, I mean, we saw a lot of depth players in that playoff roster and guys that we were getting good play from that you would not have expected to have been recalled and playing as well as they were. And as much as I don't want to hold up that team as kind of the model or anything, I feel like this year is a lot like that as we're getting these weird players coming in guys that we've never heard of or guys that haven't really been a contributor for a while like Juris and you're getting fantastic play out of them I mean look at a guy like Mike Commodore back then I think that he got another contract right after that for more than he was worth because he had a great run with the Flames Mm-hmm. and even lesser guys like Montador and Billy Niemann they were all good players as well for us in that run and none of them were traditional acquisitions either and having the good players, the good draft picks, like Berchi, Jankowski, Monahan, Poirier, Klimchuk, and uh, Bennett, if you add all these secondary players that are also developing well, like you're starting to see what's looking like the formation of an actual Stanley Cup caliber team a couple of years before it's actually ready to do that. <laughs> And I think not just a Stanley Cup team, but a team that is going to be young enough and have the talent cheap enough that they can compete for several years without having to blow this team up. I mean, I'm not saying they're going to win, you know, four or five cups in a row, but I think that this is going to be a young team that we're going to see being competitive for a number of years with essentially the same core. Yeah, uh, I could see the Flames ending up in the same kind of position that Chicago did when, like, the, after they first won. They needed to move some people out and all that, but were still good enough that they could continue being one of the top teams. And I think Calgary is kind of going down that same road, although we don't have the same number of iffy contracts. Yeah, no, and I think, well, and I think this is one thing that we learn 
from each team before us, right? I mean, people look at Chicago and learn something from them, and people look at, you know, L.A. and learn something from them. And I think that that's probably one of the big things the Flames learned is if you're going to do this, you've got to do it with as good a contract as you can get. And I I imagine there's other teams now who are starting to think about a rebuild in the next two, three years and are probably holding up Calgary as a great example of how we've done that. We've used the draft. We've drafted depth. We brought that depth in slowly, but we never really blew the whole team up. We traded away a lot of core veteran pieces, but if you look at this team, there's still a handful of guys that were here from the Aginla era, if you will. So I, I'm hoping that other teams are looking at us and saying that's the model we want to follow. Well, you wouldn't want to follow Edmonton and their embarrassment. So There's other models out there. Oh, yeah. It's just any time you can take a dig at Edmonton, it's all good. That's right. <laughs> You, we've been doing a lot of that lately. They give us a lot to uh, a lot to talk about. Oh, and by the way, on that same ranking that had Calgary second, yeah, this is an interesting stat. Edmonton was twenty fifth. Like how how are you that bad? How? I bet I bet if they rated them by position, we'd find that they probably had a lot of maybe not the best, but more top forwards than a lot of people more top centermen because that seems to be all they pick yeah but you know they they have made i mean i don't want to you know pick on them too much because we've done a lot of that but they've made some iffy picks like i know there's been times they've picked way off the board and you'll go huh why did you make that pick yeah or like last draft where they selected three overage guys that were like 20 years old in like the fourth, fifth, and sixth round. And it's like, what are you doing? Yeah, I know. So good thing that, good thing that, you know, people are starting to notice that the flames cupboards are stocked. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing all these guys that we were talking about earlier, um, play this year, play next year, even guys like, you know, Poirier coming up, but we haven't seen yet. And of all these guys, you got to remember, we still haven't seen Sam Bennett in a flames Jersey. Like, that's still, to me, the pinnacle that we're, we're working towards. Oh, I know. It's like a wealth of riches at the moment. It's bizarre. <laughs> you know, after 20 years plus of, like, ever since we selected Flurry, the Flames have never really drafted anybody of consequence. Like, unless you call Corey Stillman and Dion Phaneuf real game breakers. Uh, you know, like, we haven't had the anywhere near the system depth that we do now. You know, that's a good point. Maybe the hockey gods are finally shining down on Calgary and saying, you know what, you've drafted horribly for so many years, we're going to throw you a break and give you some really good depth picks. Well, moving a little bit away from the prospects and looking at the team as a whole, we're at the 20-game mark, the about the quarter of the season. We've actually played 19 games so far. Um Let's take a minute and talk about what we think of the team at the 20 game point. 63 games left. What do you think so far, Matt? They have been as perfect in the first 19 games that I could have imagined them being. Did you ever expect that nine, 19 games in we would still be on this hot start that we have been? Honestly, I was expecting around now, like the last... Like, when we lost to Carolina, I thought, like, okay, finally the over. shoe is going to drop. And uh, the, we're going to start seeing other teams match the Flames, both in effort and in skill. And then we play Phoenix and Ottawa, and we handled each of them quite effectively. So, whether or not, like, the next couple of weeks will be a good indication of how this team will fare... They actually play some high-end talent. They play the Ducks a couple times in the next week and a half. The Blackhawks, I think they play the Sharks as well. The so, Devils. The, yeah, so it. I'm still hesitant to be going, oh, we're going to go for the playoffs just yet, just because it's a little bizarre we're a year and a half into a rebuild we should not be doing this good <laughs> it's great for the sea of red though what a great oh season yeah we've had it, so far. it's yeah it has been absolutely fantastic as a flames fan and very encouraging that even though 
these results might not be sustainable, at least they've got enough talent in the cupboard that they can make something like this happen. Yeah, when I reflect on the team so far this year, I mean, the Flames have historically been slow starters. They've generally started slow, which generally taken them time to warm up and get going anywhere. And so when they came up with the, with the fast start this year, I was really excited. I was excited that we were winning right off the bat. I mean, we had a, a bad uh, first game, but things started going up from there. And I think the big thing, if I look back at Flames teams over the past 10 years that have derailed some of the teams that maybe had a shot at the playoffs was always having a rash of injuries late in the season. So I feel like we've had the hot start. We've got all the injuries out at the beginning of the year. We've taken all the adversity that usually we get, and we've you know totally been able to fight through it. We're seeing how great the system is. I agree with you. I don't think it's time for playoff talk, but to me, this does not look like it's 20 games of hot play. This looks like a team that is going to do something special this year. Maybe not special to the other 30 markets, but for the Sea of Red, I think this is going to be a season that we're going to look back at episode 90 and still be talking about the 2014-2015 season because I think it's going to be a, a, a milestone in turning around this rebuild. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that despite the Flames having a whole slew of injuries, like realistically four of their top nine players have been sidelined for almost a month, we haven't missed them at all. And the kids that have come in to replace them have been as good, if not better, than the people that they've been replacing. So that, to me, is both shocking and amazing, because that just doesn't normally happen, really. For sure, yeah. I know there's been times in the past where we've, uh, you know, had a big player go down, and you look at the farm, and you're calling up a Chris Kalanos or someone like that. And it's like, really, this is the best guy that we can summon from the farm to fill this spot? And, I mean, if you were to just put the name out there of Josh Juris, people probably thought the same thing. Really, this is the best guy they've got? But the fact that all these kids are stepping up um, and filling that role so well, that shows that no matter what happens this year, we have the talent to, I believe, battle through anything that's going to happen. Yeah, and... The thing is, is that we still have guys like Bill Arnold, uh, Poirier, Hanowski on the farm that are also doing very well. So, like, even if there was more injuries, we still have legitimate players that you can call up and stick in, and they should be fine. Like, they, they're they doing just as good down there as some of the players up here are doing. So, like, it, it's just... <sighs> kind of unfamiliar as a Flames fan in a very positive way that, like, wow, we have all these good players. What is going on? <laughs> well, and as a Flames fan, you have to, I mean, coming from an organization that hasn't had a lot of success in the past 10 years, you almost keep thinking to yourself, what could go wrong? Like, something has to go wrong, and what's it going to be? I know I've been thinking about that over the past week. Like, Something has to go terribly wrong, and what's it going to be? Because I can't see anything that could go horribly wrong at this point. I know. It's like we've been all conditioned to wait for the shoe to drop of, oh, something's going to screw up. Like, like I was very worried when Giordano got hit in the face with the stick the other day that, like, oh, well, he's going to be out for a while, and there goes our season. Like, that's the immediate response really that because things don't usually work out when i was watching that game i was worried about geo too but as i started thinking about it i thought look at how the forwards have filled in for each other i don't think we could get someone in to do it all year if geo was out but if he was out for a week or two i have no doubt we could call up a blue liner and get that role not filled as well as geo but give somebody else the chance to step up and play with brody and backfill pretty well yeah, like, we wouldn't probably be anywhere near as good, but with how they're playing, I think you could remove anybody from the lineup for a week or two and not really see any impact. It's just how crazy this team has been though, lately. Yeah, and it's, you know, it, it's awesome to see as a Flames fan. The legendary Peter Marr used to say, 
The first 20 games, you can't really tell anything about a team. It's games 20 to 40 during the year that really tell you what that team is made of. And coming up on that, I think the fact that we're coming off uh, you know, two wins going in against the Ducks, who are a hard opponent, I think this is going to be a tough week for the Flames with the Ducks, the Blackhawks, and the Devils coming up, and then the Ducks, the Sharks, and the Coyotes the following week. But I think, I don't know, I, I don't, I, again, I don't want to say playoffs at all, but I think this team's for real this year. I think they're really going to challenge a lot of teams, and I think we're going to see what every guy on this roster is made of because I think there's going to be a lot of guys fighting for one of the few flaming seas that are going to be out there. You can only carry 23, so only 23 guys can be wearing that jersey at any time. Well, the scary thing to me is it's not like Johnny Gaudreau, for example, has been carrying the play. No, like, he, hasn't. he hasn't. He hasn't contributed anything offensively for a few games now, and yet it's full steam ahead. And we're getting other guys to step up. Granlin scored, Juris scored, Byron's had three in the last couple of games. Berchie's added assists. Like, it, it's just... And, and that's the great thing, too, is a, everyone's stepping fan. in and making, you know, their role evident. And even guys that we're not expecting goals from are coming out and producing offensively. And that's what you need. You need that complete team effort to get anywhere. Well, even Lance Bulma, I think he scored his fourth or fifth goal against Ottawa as well. And... Just, uh, like, you're not expecting offensive outbursts from a guy like that. He's more supposed to be a defensive forward, and yet he's contributing too. It's just unbelievable, really. (laughs) I I have a feeling that if the Flames keep playing like this, there is going to be a huge market come deadline day for anyone wearing a Flaming C, pretty much. Oh, well, yeah, if we're outside the playoffs then yeah i think pretty much anybody because we seem to have that identity of being a hard-working team and if you're going to acquire one of our guys you're getting a hard-working player so definitely i agree with you there now matt there's been a lot of talk this year about the you know eichel mcdavid hannafin draft and wanting the flames to i wouldn't say tank but perhaps be at the bottom end of the draft so that we can get one of those players. What do you think is more important right now? The con- not saying they're going to tank, but the continued success of the Calgary Flames becoming kind of this emerging playoff team or getting one of those talents this year? What would you rather see from this team? Honestly, it's good that we're winning, and like I'm hoping that we continue to win. I, I hate the Edmonton Oilers and the Buffalo Sabres and their loser attitudes and get that as far away from me as possible. Like when we were looking at the team on paper before the season and you compare them to the other teams in the league, they didn't really stack up. So at talking about the flames being in that McDavid Eichel race, That was legitimate because who would have figured that we'd be getting the level of play that we have from everybody? Yeah, except for Aaron Ward. You know, and we thought he was crazy at the beginning of the year, but Aaron Ward's starting to look like a big genius right now. Yeah, and if the Flames end up picking in the eight to ten range or even lower, oh well there's still going to be good players. This draft is actually abnormally deep where you can get guys that would have been in the eight to 10 range last year at the, like around the 20th overall selection. So it's a really talented draft. So even if we aren't picking McDavid, Eichel, Hannafin or Kylington, we'll still get somebody good. So it's not, as important in my mind yeah to me the way that this team's been set up i mean they've been setting up with the winning attitude i mean bob hartley's changed things the uh brian burke era here has changed things they've been setting up a winning attitude and you can't really say we're trying to bring in these young kids we're trying to give them a shot but you know it'd really be nice if we didn't do all that well i think that with the attitude we're trying to set up here and the way we're trying to build this team if you got success you've got to ride it and 
as much as it pains me to say it, if if we can make it into a postseason or close to a postseason, I don't. I think at some point you have to say we we need to pass on that generational talent to keep the curve going up. Well, the thing is, is that you. It's not like basketball where one guy can win you a championship. You know, yes, the NHL will have a a LeBron James-esque player in Connor McDavid enter the league next year. But there's still 19 other players on the team. And the Flames seem to have a lot of very good pieces that are all on pace to become a solid NHL team. While it would be better to get a McDavid, honestly, I would rather have the Flames have that winning mentality and attitude and the hard work and all that than trying to learn how to do that on the fly after getting a guy like McDavid. Yeah, no, I think you're. I think you're right. If you can f- backfill that spot almost with six or seven guys, I mean, what if a team gets McDavid and he ends up like like Bennett this year and he's out all season? Now you got nothing for at least a year. Well, even like you look at the Edmonton Oilers, and I'm I'm going to bring them up because they've sucked for a long time, and they got their good number one overall selections three years in a row. And guess what? They still suck. And they're going to continue to suck. And and it's a never-ending cycle because they don't understand how to win. And getting that winning culture, in my mind, is a lot more important than the, necessarily than the players that you might select. Yes, it would be good. You know, it would be good to get... a. Uh, Mario Lemieux in his prime, but, you know, Mario Lemieux only won two Stanley Cups. Well, I was about to say the same so, thing. Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Eric Lindros, none of these guys were winning. I guess, you know, Gretzky's a little bit of a different deal, but, yeah, none of them were winning consistently year after year. Yeah, and, like, if you look at the LA Kings, they've won two of the, the more recent Stanley Cups, and... They, other than Drew Doughty, they haven't had any of their players being selected in the top five. So, yeah, we have Bennett, and, and like he could fill that role of being the star player for us. But you look at L.A., like, Kopitar was a 10th overall selection. Brown was in the teens. They acquired Carter and Richards through trade. Quick was a third-round pick. Like, that's the core of their team, though. And, like, even Voinoff was a seventh-round pick. So, you know, getting the pieces in there is the important part. How you get them, in my mind, is not as important. Yeah. And, I mean, if I look at L.A., you're right, a lot of those pieces are not... And I look at L.A. as a complete team. Like, I think they're one of the teams out there that almost mimics Calgary in that respect. And they're not just one or two core guys they seem like they have a complete team in place from top to bottom and yeah not all their guys are top I mean even look at a guy like Kopitar 11th overall so it almost feels apt that if the Flames are going to have that generational talent it almost not be the first or second overall pick it almost be someone like Goudreau who surprised us from the fourth or third round and becomes this you know mammoth power mouth powerhouse player for the flames that almost seems like with the way this team's being built that would be fitting yeah and like if you look at la this year tanner pearson and uh tyler toffoli pearson was selected 30th overall and toffoli was a second round pick so yet they're the offensive catalyst for la right now so like to me it doesn't really matter where you're getting players, it's more finding the right guys and selecting them. Like, even, like, a guy like Brendan Saad or Andrew Shaw for Chicago, like, Saad was in the second round and Shaw was a fifth-round pick. And yet they've been really solid second, third-line guys for Chicago. 
once they moved out, the Bufflins and Lads and Bolins and all those guys. For sure. So, as much as I hate to say it, because he probably is another player like Marilyn Mew, I think right now with what we're seeing with the Flames' development, they would be better off to play through the year, be as successful as possible, and build with the pieces they've got instead of trying to get that, you know, perhaps not doing as well. I'm not saying they would tank, but perhaps, you know, having a poor second half of the season and being in contention for those guys. I think right now we got to keep moving up. Yeah, and that's not to say that, say, like Giordano, Brody, and all the rest of the guys that have been on a hot streak, that they don't cool off and we don't end up in the top eight in the draft. It could very well happen. It's just that you don't want to say, oh, well, we shouldn't win. Let's suck. Yeah, winning is not important this year. Yeah, like, it's too hard to turn that around, and... Like, we've seen previous iterations of the Flames where they were lazy. And it's been a revelation of late that the Flames have been a hard-working, outwork-the-other-team-every-night type of team. And to go away from that wouldn't be in the Flames' best interest. Yeah, I feel like we've bottled some lightning here, and we have to ride it as long as we can. And you know, keep the work ethic going. I think the Flames are finally establishing the identity of who the Calgary Flames are going to be going forward. And that's all we can do is keep keep running with that. Yeah, well, once we get back into the playoffs legitimately, probably not this year, but possibly next year or moving forward, we're not going to be a fun team to match up against in the postseason because we'll hit you and we'll score on you and we'll beat you. So, you know, because usually the playoff teams that win are the hard-working, in-your-face, non-stop motor teams. It's, you don't normally see a team that's, they might have all the talent in the world, but they're kind of lazy Sort of like what Calgary was about five or six, seven years ago, where they were very talented, but not the most hardworking team. Those teams don't usually win. I think the other thing that work in our advantage, especially if we keep the depth as as deep as it is right now, if we do make the playoffs, is you won't be able to get rid of us. I mean, you take out one guy, we'll call up another. You take out someone else, we'll call up another. Like, we've got enough players. I think we can simply be almost the Energizer Bunny team. Of we'll just keep going and going and going and calling up prospects until, you know, we can probably outmatch other teams before they'll be able to outmatch our depth. Yeah, and the key moving forward is for the Flames to keep getting good players that will be NHL talents. Like, say, like, Hunter Smith, the last draft. He's not necessarily going to be a top six forward, but he should be an NHL player. And that, in my mind, is necessary. So, like, once we start bumping up against the cap down the road, that we'll have legitimate replacements, and, like, we can just keep rolling over and over and over on teams with fresh faces like how Chicago has with Sod and Shaw and all the rest of their guys. For sure. Going back to the 20-game uh, recap, are you surprised that at this point in the season, Devin Setaguchi has played half, 10, well, I guess just over half now because we're at the 19-game mark, but played pretty much half of the game so far for the Flames? Well... <sighs> Because of the Flames being injured as much as they have been, I'm not that surprised that he's drawn in. I just don't see him staying once you start getting Mason Raymond and Backlund and Colborne and the rest of the guys back. Uh, He is, in my mind, he's the first guy on the way out. If you were to look in August at where we would have been right now, I don't think either of us would have expected that Setaguchi would have been in half the games. Uh, it would have depended on how well he was performing. Like, if he would actually had come in and scored a bunch, then I could have seen him playing Well, of that course, much, that's true but... of any player, but, I mean, we'd both pegged this guy as potentially on his way to the farm when we did our opening day rosters. 
True. So I mean, if you know, if Boley came in and scored a whole bunch, there's a chance he could have been put on the second line too. There's always variables, but looking at the player we had on paper, I think that we're he's got a lot more chance than he deserves, perhaps because of the situation. And I think that, as you said, he's been given all the chances in the world, and I think he's going to be the first guy they're going to look at to say, "This is the guy that I think has to move out." Yeah, well, are you going to say, oh, Juris, you've scored so many points, but we're going to keep Devin Sataguchi? Of course not. So, or you could say that to Granlund or even Berchi. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so. And, and I think if Sataguchi had only played two or three games so far, you might say, well, we haven't given him a chance. Show us what he's got. But 10 games is more than enough, you know, half the game so far to see what we've got in him this season. Yeah, and he hasn't put up anything and has looked quite bad out there most of the games that he's played in. So, yeah, no, uh, his time in Calgary, unfortunately for him, is drawing to a close. I hope that next year, because uh, he's likely going to go to the AHL, after next year like he can go to Europe and hopefully rediscover himself and come back uh yeah you know, I, I don't have anything against him it's just for whatever reason it's just not working for him right now he's got 10 games under his belt no points of any kind he's a minus seven which is not great if we look at the other player that i wasn't expecting much from this year is david jones who's also got 10 games now i mean he's always hurt he's hurt again now no surprise but he's got five points and he's a plus three so he's pretty much a you know, half point a game guy at this point. I I don't know about you, but I'm seeing. I'm not saying he's the best player on the team, but I'm seeing more from Jones this year than I was anticipating ever seeing from him as a flame player. He's in on the rush. He knows what he's doing. He hasn't made a lot of really dumb mistakes that I've seen. When he's in the lineup, he's the four million dollar David Jones. The problem with him is that he's only playing half the games because he can't seem to stay healthy. I don't know if there's a way to really address that, though. Keep him in the press box. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. He has been quite effective. It's just, for whatever reason, he just seems to randomly get hurt. And it's unfortunate because he has played like a four million dollar forward it's just yeah he's out again whether he'll be back in time for tomorrow's game is yet to be determined but it's just a good thing that the flames have so many qualified replacement players that even though he is hurt we can fill in for him with somebody else yeah and his contract is this year and next year And I think, you know, I hope he's saving his money well because I don't think there's ever a chance, especially with how hurt he is, he's ever going to make near $4 million again. So, you know, there's maybe the bad contract that we were talking about earlier, a guy who's playing half the games and getting paid $4 million. Um, But, I mean, like you said, when he's in the lineup, I like what I see. But when I heard he's out again, I just kind of roll my eyes. Like, oh, Jones is hurt again? Come on, man. Yeah. Uh, I hope that he can find some way to remain healthy it he you know it's one of those things that he's gonna have a hard time even getting another contract after this one from anybody because you can't rely on him to stay in the lineup and would you rather go sign would you rather go sign somebody for maybe a little bit more money that will play 70 to 80 games than have Jones who might play 30 to 40. For sure. And, you know, I think, I don't think Jones's time in the NHL will be done after this, but I think his next contract will be sub-million dollar because if you're playing half the time, I'm going to pay you like a halftime player. Yeah, and like at that rate, I would even say that it wouldn't be a necessarily a bad thing even for Calgary to keep him, but... With the 23-man yeah. roster limit, it might be. Yeah, true. Depending on what a roster... I mean, if we could have unlimited players, I'd say, yeah, keep them. But I don't know if I'd want to put a guy like that on my 23-man roster. And by the time that happens, a lot of these young players are going to have waiver eligibility, and we're not going to be able to bring them up and down as freely as we can right now. True. 
But if you look at Jones's uh, career, I mean, in 08, 09 with the Avalanche, he played 40 games. In 09, 10, he played 23. 10, 11, he played 77. And the next year, 72. So he was healthy for a couple of years there. And then in the 12, 13 season, he played 33 games, 48 last year with us, and now 10. So, I mean, you know, here's a guy that has had a, a career history of not, he's never played a full season. The closest he's got 77, which is pretty good, but a guy who's got a career history of not playing a lot of games. Yeah, it's just frustrating because he does have talent. And, like, if he was playing 82 games, like, he would be a good 35, 40 point third line player for us. It's just. It well, doesn't look, w- seem to be working that way. Yeah, if you um, look at his best seasons, I mean, in 2010-2011, uh, when he played 77 games, he got 45 points. In 2011-2012, he played 72 games, he got 37 points. That's the kind of production I expect to see from a guy making $4 million. Yeah, it's just frustrating, because like, even at the 5 points in 10 games, he's on a 40-point pace over an 80-game schedule. It's just you know that he's not going to be able to do that, and it's frustrating. For some of the kids, though, it might be a blessing in disguise because if we've got this guy who's hard to stay healthy, it means more spots are going to be open. True. Well, let's uh, let's look at the week ahead. Um, We've got Peter Marr night coming up tomorrow night, Tuesday night. They're honoring the Hall of Famer Peter Marr. Any ideas what they're going to do for Peter? Your guess is as good as mine. I'm hoping that they raise him to the forever aflame thing and give him a banner and the whole nine yards. That, to me, it seems appropriate for all that Peter's done for this organization. For sure. We'll see you tomorrow. I, th- I don't know if anyone said, I don't want to toot my own horn, I don't know if anyone suggested before that, but I know we threw that suggestion out originally here on Fireside Chat last season when we interviewed Beasley about Peter Marr and I threw that suggestion out to Beasley and he thought it was an apt uh, you know thing for Peter too I know right now we have the TV broadcast booth which is the Ed Whalen broadcast booth in the Saddle Dome I think another fitting thing to do would be to rename the radio broadcast booth the Peter Marr broadcast booth having Whalen and Marr next to each other seems fitting as well so I'd love to see Peter's face up next to Neuendijk and McInnes in the Forever Flame program, and I'd love to see his name every time I walk in there and look up at the radio broadcast team. I can't disagree with you at all. I hope that the Flames do the classy thing and give him his dues that he's well-deserved. Well, we're on the topic of Peter Marr. Have you listened to many games on the radio this year? Uh, none, actually. I'm really surprised. I was... I was hesitant to listen to any games on the radio because I didn't know what to expect. And I have to say that I'm impressed. Derek Willis, who's taken over, um, definitely not Peter Marr, but he's a season announcer. He's not a young, you know, new guy trying to come up with his identity. And I, I think he's doing a good job. I mean, it's hard to get Peter out of your head and hard to not want a yeah baby after all these wins. But... It's I, I like what we're hearing there, and I think that he's a good fit for the Calgary Flames. Well, I'm glad to hear that he's doing well. I just, I've been watching the games, or I'm at the Saddle Dome, so I haven't had the opportunity yet. If anyone's I like did, Matt, I did hear him. Listened. Sorry, go ahead. I did, I did listen to him uh, during the preseason, though, uh, when... Uh, during the Prospects tournament, I did listen to him then, and I thought he was doing well. So if anyone else is like Matt and hasn't heard him, I'd encourage you to listen to one of the games this month, um, and just listen to Derek Willis call it, along with P. Lombardius, because I feel like those two are starting to get their groove together. They're starting to get their timing down now. And I, I think that you know we have to move past Peter Marr, and listen to what we're going to have for the next... I mean, he's a young guy. He'll probably be here for the next 10 years if he wants to be. So I feel like we have to listen to him and see what we've got now as the voice of the Calgary Flames. Yeah, I'm also encouraged by the TV broadcasts as well. Uh, Rick Ball and Kelly Rudy have done an absolutely superb job doing play-by-play and color for all the Sportsnet broadcasts. 
you know, I knew Kelly Rudy from, you know, all the stuff he was doing before with Hockey Night in Canada and whatnot. I wasn't familiar with Rick Ball, but yeah, those guys have gelled really well. And I think that giving Kelly more of the color role, um, I've really liked him in that in that role. He's a great analyst. He's good at, you know, finding some of those quirky facts and he he gels fantastically with Rick Ball. So we've got two very, very good broadcast teams for the Flames. Which, you know, as we start to watch this team more as they're winning and they start getting into some postseason action in a couple of years, these are the voices that we're going to be hearing. Yeah, and I'm very encouraged by how good the, the broadcasts have been with Sportsnet. I know they've been getting ragged on before, but the whole presentation has improved significantly since they became the sole rights holder. I think like a lot of things, when you have a big contract, you become complacent in doing it your way. And I think with Sportsnet taking on all this, they've been able to give a new look to how should we present hockey on TV. And you're seeing some interesting ideas, some stuff I like, some stuff I don't like. But yeah, I think overall it's definitely been a different look at hockey. Mm -hmm. Have you been watching Hockey Night in Canada? What do you think of George Strombolopoulos? Uh, he's doing a good job. I, uh, you know, I liked Ron McLean. It, it'll take some adjustment to see him in a reduced role, but it, Strombo does know his stuff, so I can't complain too much. He knows his stuff better than I thought he was going to. I thought he was just going to be kind of the guy to pass questions on and get the discussion moving, but he, he doesn't seem as clueless, I guess, as I expected him to. Well, if I recall correctly, he actually started in hockey, so it's not entirely surprising that he's able to do it quite effectively. Yeah, I mean, he can call the game, but he also knows all the current facts and stuff. Now, how much of that is him, and how much is that someone on the teleprompter, we don't know. But he works well with those guys, too. I think being kind of the non-hockey guy there, he brings a different element to the hockey panel. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's been good to start. Hopefully... CBC continues to have a good telecast over the next few years as well. So Matt, looking ahead this week, we have the Ducks tomorrow, we have the Blackhawks on Thursday, and we have the Devils on Saturday. Six points on the table. What do you think the Flames are going to skate away with? It's a tough week. I think this might be the toughest week we've had so far. Yeah, if they'll likely have the best opportunity to beat the Devils, but that's because they're an Eastern Conference team. Uh, it, honestly, if they get more than two points this week, that's a successful week in my opinion. If they can manage to beat either Anaheim or Chicago, that would, that would be fantastic. I agree with you. I think, sadly, we're going to walk away with a loss on Peter Marnight um, against the Ducks. We always have a problem playing the Ducks. I think the Blackhawks are going to overpower us, but to me, I think of those two games, even if we don't get the W, I want to see how well this team's able to maintain their composure when they get down to good teams. I want to see if they fall apart and flop, or if they're able to keep playing their way. Well, one of the things to consider is that for most of this season thus far, we've been playing the Eastern Conference a lot, and the weaker sisters in the western conference so now between now and christmas it's pretty much one hard team after another all the way so this will be what calgary's all about will they go on a huge eight game losing streak or something like that it's feasible Uh, the competition level is going to be like nothing that they've faced thus far It'll be interesting to see. They are definitely in tough. It's not going to be an easy road for the next little bit. So I'm looking forward to it. Can they actually skate with the big boys? If they can, then this team has a good shot at being a playoff team. If not, then, well, we'll be closer to getting McDavid or Eichel. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think, too, the Flames have banked enough points so far that we can afford to stumble a little bit against the big teams and then readjust. I mean, we can't, you know, tank in all of them, but I think even if we were to get two points this week and maybe two points next week, we've got points in the bank that we can kind of rely on there 
while we regroup and figure out a different strategy to take on the big boys. But yeah, no, I agree with you. This is really going to be a telling week. And I think if you're just looking at the W's and the L's, you're not going to totally tell the whole story. It's going to be a matter of how well does this team play Calgary Flames hockey against these big players in the NHL. Yeah, like if they lose to Chicago, say, 2-1, but they keep up with them all night and are going pound for pound with them, well, yeah, you lost, but that's still an encouraging thing. So it'll depend. Like if they get outshot 50 to 20 like the last time they played Chicago, then yeah, that's not too encouraging. <laughs> yeah, and I think with these young players in the line, well, last time we played Chicago, we won 2 to 1. Yeah, but that was more <laughs> of a luckier performance than anything. I think for a lot of these young players, it's going to be how well they can play their game too and not get frustrated. Um, you know, they've come in, they've had a lot of success. How well are they going to do? against probably players that they've idolized so far as young players. I mean, there's a lot of good players in these teams I bet these guys look up to, but also, how are they going to do with the adversity? Telling times coming up. And as we've got some veterans starting to come back in the lineup over the next couple weeks too, that'll be interesting to see where they slot in. And who will get sent down first and second and third. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, before we sign off tonight, let's take a trip down to Adirondack and talk about what's going on with the farm team. Uh, they're on a pretty hot streak right now. They have five games in a row that they've won. Yeah, and they've won seven of eight after their dismal start, and they're now sixth in the AHL in the Eastern Conference. And I think the thing to remember is this isn't just a team that's won five in a row. This is a team that's won five in a row without the guys that were supposed to be their best players this year because they've all been summoned to the NHL. Yeah, and Ben Hanowski had a hat trick against uh, Lake Erie on Friday night, and Bill Arnold has collected goals in each of the games this week. Two goals against uh, Rochester and one each against Lake Erie, and Poirier has an assist in each game, and he got the shootout winner in the most recent performance. Just like in Calgary, we have young players stepping up into roles that you know are new to them and increased roles. We're seeing that in Adirondack too. I watched the two like uh, the Monsters games, the Lake Erie games, and yeah, we're starting to see guys. Um, you know, T- Elson wasn't looking too bad in some of those games. Um, Poirier looked really good. Um, you know, as you said, Hanowski, fantastic. So I think we're starting to see guys playing roles they wouldn't have if all the players that are in Calgary right now were wearing Adirondack jerseys. So that's good, too, that we're going to test and see what we really have down there as far as depth players. Well, that's the key to a rebuild is having opportunities arise and then having players actually take advantage of it. And both Hanowski and Bill Arnold have, since the recalls of all the other guys, they have really stepped up their games and have taken on leadership roles down there. Whether that continues once players start returning or not is yet to be seen but it's still encouraging that those players are contributing because like realistically if you take any team's top five players you expect them to go on a losing streak not win seven of eight exactly not look better since they've lost their top players Mm -hmm. and we're seeing that in both calgary and anirondack yeah fantastic depth it's actually quite confusing as a flames fan <laughs> you know i'd seen some some uh, ahl games for the flames before and it was always you could tell the level was there but i never felt invested in the team it always felt like this distant piece of the flames i guess that i'm like well what is this this you know i don't know these guys and this year i'm enjoying watching adirondack because they do they feel like underdogs and you also feel like you already know a lot of these players or need to root for these players because they just feel like an extension of the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and you know that like guys like Poirier are going to be up in Calgary in the not-too-distant future. So, yeah, it's definitely more interesting to watch than how the normal AHL games would be. And uh, just another Adirondack note, the player of the week for last week in the uh, in the chronicle their newspaper there the glen falls chronicle named uh turner elson number 13 the centerman is the player of the week and he did have a pretty good week down there oh yeah um it 
it's all good. Like uh, they have been getting pretty good performances from a whole bunch of players. Like even David Wolf was looking quite good out there. I think he had a goal this week as well. One of the players that I've noticed who's had the biggest turnaround is uh, Yoni Ordio. It seems like he's finally settled down and is starting to look like the Yoni Ordio that we need him to be, not the kind of sporadic player who didn't look like he did last year. To be, I don't know what was wrong with Ordio, but he just didn't look like himself at the beginning of the year. No, he looked like he was at the 2013 development camp where like, I ripped him on... Uh, the articles back then uh, he just didn't seem to give a crap really well that's why he started in the ECHL last year exactly and he was looking more like that guy instead of what we saw later on in the season and that'll be key for him moving forward like if he wants to become an NHL goalie is he has to not be terrible for the first month of the season before figuring out how to actually be a good goalie yeah you can't have a goalie when you're coming into a year where you need to compete and say oh well he'll be fine come october or november yeah more like the middle of november <laughs> so you know it you can get away with a guy like aginla not warming up for till the middle of november but you can't have your goaltender <laughs> For sure. That's that's the most important position. You can't have somebody struggling to that extent for as long as he has. It's good that he's turning it around. It's just a, you need to figure out some way of getting him to be better right off the hop. I think the other thing I'm noticing watching the game is I'm seeing more than I have in as long as I can remember. A, so much more of a similar style between the NHL and the AHL team. There doesn't seem to be like they're... They don't seem to be two different teams. They seem like they're one team that is, you know, one whole unit. And I think that's really one of the things that uh, Trilliving wanted to bring in when he got rid of uh, Troy Ward and brought in Ryan Hushka as the coach is he wanted to make sure that this was one unit, being coached the same way, playing the same hockey and to me, we're seeing that now this year, which we really, we sort of saw it last year, but we never really saw the one connected unit. Mm-hmm. And they're as hard working as the Calgary Flames as well, which that's another encouraging thing to see as like they're getting that identity of like, oh, this is what I have to be to be an NHL player. I think a lot of that's the reason why these guys are being able to excel when we call them up is we're not asking anything more of them than they were being asked in the AHL. I mean, yeah, it's a higher pace and everything, but they already understand what Calgary Flames hockey is. Yeah, and when you're already doing a lot of hard work, it's not that hard to go somewhere else that's a little more challenging and continue to work hard. Yeah, it's a different level, obviously, but it's... um. It's already what they're doing. They're working them hard down there. They're getting these guys, you know, in shape every night. And when you come to Calgary, it's just a matter of, okay, I got to keep working hard. It's, like you said, it's par for the course. It's what they're expected, what they're trained to do already as a member of this organization. Well, the thing is, is that with all the call-ups, Juris, Granlin, Furlan, Reinhardt, and Berchi, none of them have looked like a fish out of water. No. So it's like, okay. I think the real test is going to be when we start acquiring veterans who haven't been in the flame system for a while and seeing how they do when they're asked to put in harder work than they have in the past. True. Because young guys, I mean, we teach them what we want them to be, and they're 18, 19 when they come into the system, and I think that's easy to get them kind of working along those same lines. But if we start acquiring players who have been in perhaps, you know, franchises that didn't work them as hard, I think it's going to be curious to see what happens with some of those guys. If they fall into line and start working hard, or if it's the, I don't want to work this hard, I don't have to work this hard. And I think we might see players who don't last here as long, perhaps, um, because they're just, they're not able to keep up. Yeah, and if so, good riddance. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) To me, there's nobody that's going to be good enough that you can say, well, you can have a different work ethic than everybody else. No, and we saw that with Aginla at at times, really, where he wasn't really the most dogged player on the ice, 
and how that rubbed off on literally everybody else. And the Flames got a bit of a lazy ap- attitude over the last, like, six, seven years prior to the... Well, pretty much between the lockouts, really. And now we're doing the right things with having everybody work hard, so... Yeah, I feel like the again the thing permeated through the whole locker room and really changed the attitude of the whole team. And I think now we got to keep this momentum going. And I don't care who it is, if it's you know if Giordano starts to lose his passion or whoever it is, we got to get that person out of here and move on and find the next guy because we can't let it get to that same point again. No, nobody's replaceable. And having all the kids come up and learn how to do things the right way will be beneficial because if a veteran isn't pulling their weight then you can just slot another kid in instead for sure well matt let's uh let's wrap this one up let's hope the flames can skate away with more than two points this week i think like you they're gonna be hard pressed to get more than two but let's hope for the best and we will talk to you again next week have fun everybody thanks for listening here's to another 60 Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.